Let's take a little time now and the little time we've got left to help the primary care guys and women understand some of the basics here. In other words, you're sitting across from a patient, you say you've got COPD, uh, I want you to use inhaler or a device. How do you go about just pragmatically, clinically, working this through with a patient and how do you discuss this choice? First of all, you have to understand the, particularly out in the, my community practice, that the literacy is about the level of diabetes, so it's not really very, very high in general in COPD, so you have to take that into account. Matter of fact, that was a huge problem when uh, vendors would change from a, uh, a dry powder, for example, to a meter dose inhaler without any directions. L literacy among whom? Uh, the patients. Uh, because many of the patients with COPD are maybe not in New York, but certainly in the Carolinas, low literacy. So we did picture books for the American College of Physicians, just like we do in diabetes, to try to help. The other is to use the, the principle, keeping it simple. If you can use one device for all these different, either combined in one, so you don't have to teach three different devices, and we're beginning to have that now, uh, that would, uh, would make it a little bit easier, or the fixed dose combinations that, that we have been talking about here. And then, you know, the family docs are really good at looking at one disease in the setting of seven others. So they're already doing that, but to just think about, you know, COPD, think about what Byron and, and, everyone, and Frank and Fernando have, have been talking about here, that this is an important uh, component of the, uh, of the illness and, uh, you know, in the personalized medicine, again, approach. You can't simply prescribe a medication. You have to show people how to use the inhalers, and then you have to use a teach-back phenomena so that you know that they're using it correctly. And it's become very complicated because, as everyone knows, insurances are now deciding what medicines people will be on. And I'm increasingly finding people who I've taught how to use an inhaler who now, two months later, their insurance has switched them to another inhaler. Uh, and first of all, you could argue that not all drugs of the same class are the same. If I've got a 25-year-old asthmatic, it may not matter whether what LABA ICS they're on, but I've got a 75-year-old guy with atrial fibrillation who's tolerating one LABA, they may not tolerate another LABA. But beyond that, in COPD in particular, where inhaler knowledge is so important, this constant switching of different inhalers is problematic at best. So Frank, this is the thing that I've seen in the last two to three years as the most dramatic component of, of my practice has been the incredible influence that payers have on what's available, what you can use, and the complexity that that raises to our clinics. I'm sure the primary care guys are dealing with this in a much more difficult fashion because they get it across multiple different diseases, but in, it's just an airway disease. Terrible. It is brutal. And it also occurs to me that if, if, if Byron's right, it seems to me he is, you've got to teach someone how to use this device. You just don't throw it across the table and say, good luck. And then they've got to come back and show you that they know how yes. to use it. That takes time. Yes. So, so this is increasingly going to be a team approach to care. Uh, I think we all agree with that. We need to take advantage of respiratory therapists who we've generally underutilized. Uh, we need to take advantage of pharmacists. Pharmacists, pharmacists, pharmacists. need to begin to show yep. people how to use these things or it's not going to work. I agree. Uh, what about other therapies out there? I mean, you alluded to this earlier, that there is some stigma attached to the disease uh, because at least the perception that you did this to yourself, that you, you're a smoker, you're bad, and then you say, let's make this really public. You need oxygen. How do you introduce that and, and have people accept it and say, whoa, I feel great on this. Maybe this is worthwhile. What's, what is the technique for, for do it, doing that? So in, interestingly, uh, the, the philosophy and use of o oxygen is exactly the opposite with bronchodilators, OK? Oxygen has been proven to prolonged survival when it's necessary, okay? And so we now feel we have to prove that it prolongs survival to use it. The reality is oxygen is probably one of the best drugs in symptoms, in patients who have symptoms and drop their oxygen level and making you feel better. And so uh, oxygen, if you have low oxygen levels at rest, is absolutely necessary. Multiple studies have shown it prolongs survival. In patients who only drop their oxygen with exertion, a big study from the National Institute of Health, all these folks that were involved with this, showed it doesn't prolong survival if it only occurs during exercise, probably. But that 
says nothing about the fact that every rehab program in the country would think it's insanity to exercise a desaturating patient without giving them oxygen because they feel so much better and do so much more. And so uh, oxygen helps people and you just, you have to get the stigma uh, uh, eliminate it, at least in that patient and their family's mind, and then hopefully the rest you of know, the world it's, will it's follow. Always, it's always been somewhat amusing, and I, I don't mean amusing, ha-ha, I mean amusing, curious to me. People have less trouble smoking in public than using oxygen in public. I mean, where's the, <laughs> where, where's the disconnect? It's a good point, good well, it's it, an excellent right, point. But it's yeah. also complicated because, you know, every time someone comes into my office pulling behind them the green canisters that should have gone out of use 40 years right. ago, you know, uh, uh, some of the devices, particularly some of the, uh, the portable concentrators, uh, really work very well, especially in COPD, where the oxygen demands are not like Fernando's pulmonary fibrotic population. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, the portable concentrators work really well, but a lot of insurances don't cover them. Uh, it's a problem. And now, what about the more invasive stuff? Uh, I know, Byron, early on, you were working with some of the early studies on lung volume reduction. The question is, where, what's the role now? Okay, so let me that. comment, and I know Frank needs to talk about this as well. Uh, lung volume reduction surgery, when, it, when you pick the appropriate candidates for the surgery, works. It can improve quality of life, exercise capacity, and survival. The second thing since, uh, since, uh, uh, since uh, oxygen. Uh, and yet, at least in this country and to a large extent around the world, it is rarely used. Now, the results at my center has been remarkably good, and I would suggest in part that's because we've been able to keep the team together for a very, very long time. Now, there's a lot of interest now in some of these less invasive bronchoscopic procedures, and Frank's been a leader in that, and some of them are going to the FDA within the next year, and my hope is at least that that will be added to LBRS as an option. Yeah. So, you know, w without going into details on these, these are reasons why you need to refer to a specialist because while maintenance d therapies can be delivered by, a, by an attentive primary care doc, they're not going to be able to, to really address these much more esoteric and complex issues. So patients with obstruction with FEV1 below 50% predicted need to be referred to Byron and Fernando and Jim to evaluate them for potential even lung transplant if they're under 70 years old, lung reduction surgery, and when and if the FDA approves these less invasive approaches, um, consideration of coils and valves to reduce right. uh, lung volumes and COPD. What about so-called non-invasive ventilation? By the way, that's a term that a lot of people haven't even heard. What is it? So that's, you know, CPAP, BiPAP with uh, newer ventilator devices, AVAPs, that have been used mainly for sleep apnea in this country uh, and in the acute setting for COPD to prevent intubations. But particularly in Europe, there's data showing that these devices, when used appropriately, particularly in patients with carbon dioxide retention, can prolong survival and dramatically improve quality of life. So more studies need to be done, but we probably need to start considering the right patient to use these in. And I think the take home message to all this, not just the, uh, recognizing we need more and better and different types of medicines, the medicines we have now can work. And if you add exercise, if you add rehab, if you add the, the vaccinations, uh, if you add smoking cessation, and then to the considerations of some of these more invasive options, there's actually a lot we have to offer. So the nihilism that existed from this disease simply shouldn't exist any longer.